would remind me if I forgot. Um, so here we are. Okay, we are recording. Um, I am very excited to present our, uh, or to introduce you to our presenter for today, uh, Joshua Olson. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, I will be monitoring the chat uh, and uh, let me know what questions you might have. I'm trying to think of anything I'm missing. I think that's it. Um, I, you know, it's hard to play the role of Sam, but uh, big shoes to fill, but um, here I am. So I am going to uh, turn things over to Joshua. Joshua, you please let me know if you need anything as well. I will be here. All right, thank you, Jenny. Um, and thanks everybody for coming today. Happy Halloween. And uh, hopefully uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun and also learn about government documents. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is make sure it, everyone can hear me. I think so. And I'm going to try to share. All yes, right. Anna says, looks good. It sounds good. I think you are good to go. Perfect. All right, so our story begins. Door is locked behind you as you enter into storage. Did you forget to bring the key to get out? It's too late now. Moving through the aisles of shelves, you only find a back office, no exit. Try reading the informational poster on the back wall. The letters begin rearranging themselves into an image. I'm the spirit of documents past, but don't worry. This isn't a Christmas carol, and I'm much more than a mere bit of indigestion. I've managed to trap myself inside of this poster. My only escape is to find the original content. A computer's in that back office. You run over and boot up the machine. All right, so now our interlude where we actually learn things. So the first thing I want to talk about is a little about uh, GPO and the FDLP in case uh, not everyone uh, is up to speed on what those acronyms mean. Um, so the GPO uh, has been the official publisher of United States government information uh, since 1860. Um, so it's been around for a while now, um, producing um, government information uh, for the public. And for most of its history, uh, it has been the government printing office. Um, but in 2014, that was changed to the Government Publishing Office. Uh, so the same acronym, but slightly different word, printing, publishing. Um, I think this reflects a de-emphasis on the print format, that all information was uh, being uh, produced in and, and disseminated in. Um, and now they're using a variety of publishing solutions. Uh, most of which is online or electronic. Uh, so then uh, we have the FDLP. So the FDLP is a program that's run by GPO. The central mission of it is to disseminate this information that the government publishing office is producing. Um, and it does that through its member libraries or depositories. Um, and it manages all of those libraries as a national collection. And they often think of this in terms of a national collection. On the right, you can see an old picture that I took from the GPO website uh, from the 1940s. And that would be in Washington. Um, I also want to introduce this concept of the SUDOC uh, so that you're aware. Um, so SUDOC actually means two different things. The first thing is uh, superintendent of documents, which is actually what it's short for. Um, and that is a person who is appointed uh, by the director of the GPO and they actually run the program. Um, they administer the FDLP. Uh, but normally when people use this term, they're referring to the system 
that's used to classify and organize government documents. Uh, so <clears throat> the big thing about this system, because it's different than the Library of Congress or Dewey Decimal, in that it is arranged by provenance. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, and uh, it's got some unique punctuation that we're going to go over. So pseudocs are generally uh, split into do two different parts. Uh, you have the first part, which is called the pseudoc stem, and then the next part is just the item number. Uh, this is split by a colon, and so the stem is the first part uh, before the colon, and this tells you where the document was produced, and it also tells you which publication series from that agency uh, that it's from. The item number just identifies the volume issue. Uh, it could also refer to the date, um, as well as a couple, a couple of other things uh, that it could use to identify specifically what document it is. Um, and the last important thing with Sudocs is that you'll find a period or what looks like a decimal. And that can be confusing because the numbers are all whole numbers. And it might lead you to think that that is um, a number with a decimal and that can complicate things when you're trying to figure out the order to put documents in. So on the right of the screen, you should see in orange, um, I've got a Sudoc stem and uh, you can see it's A13, then there's a period 154 forward slash 34 colon. So the colon just tells you it's the end of the stem and um, the A uh, tells you it's the agriculture department that this is coming from. The 13 identifies that it's the forest service within the agriculture department. And then 154, this is a series of publications uh, known as the Forest Health Highlights. Uh, the 34 after the forward slash is just because we're the 34th state according to how they arrange things. Um, so there are forest health highlights for other states as well is what you should get from that. Um, but if you were ordering this, the A13154 would come after A13.90. So those two things um, are ordered as though they are whole numbers. So that's the point I want to make with that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the changes that's been occurring with the FDLP lately. Uh, namely, the FDLP is transitioning to becoming a digital uh, FDLP. And you can see on the left here, uh, this was a graph that was distributed in September of this year from the GPO, and it can show you from the 1990s until 2020 um, how they've been producing much less print output. Uh, there's just a lot less number of titles that are being produced um, in that format uh, just organically because the government agencies themselves are creating things uh, digital first. They're born digital. Um, but there's also changes that are happening happening that are uh, at a policy level. So I'm going to say a truism here. Uh, the government information consumption habits have dramatically changed because of the advent of the Internet in the late 20th century. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, it's changed a lot of our information consumption habits across the board. Um, but the GPO has been aware of this, at least since 1990, and legislation was passed uh, known as the GPO Electronic Information Access Enhancement Act of 1993. This was uh, three decades ago now, uh, but uh, the legislation said that the GPO needed to start producing um, things in electronic format, not just print format. Since then, we've seen, like according to this graph, this decrease in distribution titles, uh, but we've also seen um, some other changes that has been a part of a long process 
of transitioning to becoming a digital uh, FDLP. And this year is important because the uh, GPO director actually has officially greenlighted a full transition to being a digital FDLP. So um, it's going to be the policy to push digital online uh, first and to start producing less and less in terms of uh, print distribution. And so there's a number of challenges with that. Uh, one of the things that they had to do um, to support this is make changes to a system that they call DSIMS, which the government likes acronyms for everything. So <laughs> there's acronyms all over. Uh, but this is basically where you can create selection plans or approval plans uh, that describe the sort of content that you as a depository want to receive through the program. And you don't select based on SUDOC, which might seem like the natural option, uh, but they actually have uh, specific item numbers that that will refer to SUDOCs. Um, and those are what you're actually selection or selecting with your selection. Um, <clears throat> so that same example we had of the Agriculture Department's Forest Health Highlights for North Carolina, you can see the SUDOC and the SUDOC again for that is uh, format, format neutral. So um, you're going to get these health highlights, but you don't know is this going to come as a handout? Is this going to come as a link to a website? None of that is encoded in a SUDOC um, because SUDOCs were never intended to store that sort of information. They were uh, created at a time when uh, typewriters were still mostly in use and uh, the internet was not on their mind. Um, so that's where these item numbers come in. They've been uh, changing a lot of them uh, so that they can reflect uh, not just the type of content you're selecting, but the format as well. So you can choose print, you can choose hybrid, you can choose CDs. Um, there's even still some that I imagine they're going to get rid of uh, that are for floppies, uh, which I don't think anyone is wanting to receive today. So, <laughs> so that's some of the challenges that they've had to um, to come up against when they're trying to make this transition. Another thing that's going to happen um, very soon is that uh, regionals are going to no longer have to um, receive print material. And so regionals are uh, depositories that manage like mostly at a state level. Uh, so in our context, we're talking about Chapel Hills Federal Depository. Um, they provide a leadership role with us and um, they've always had to receive all print materials. That's going to change as a part of this uh, digital FTP implementation. Um, and the GPO is also planning to limit print offerings. Uh, so you won't even be able to uh, select everything in print necessarily. Um, on the right here, I've got some examples. Uh, this is from the FDLP and it shows that there are still some things that they're going to be printing uh, that are unlimited that you can select. Most of these are of a legal nature. Um, so U.S. reports, statutes at large, U.S. code, um, those are going to be offered still at an unlimited uh, amount or in an unlimited amount. Um, but then everything else is going to be either 20 copies in the national collection, so across the entire nation, um, or 50 copies. And you can see some examples of those uh, that are limited to 20 or 50. What they're going to look at when they distribute those limited copies are going to be uh, the four collection areas, as well as um, specific needs of, of a specific library. So if you're a library that deals with something uh, that one of these li limited copies address, then you're going to be given um, like first selection on it. 
So now I want to tra transition to our depository because we've been aligning ourselves with these changes. Uh, we also have our own um, goals and our own uh, particularities that we have to take into account. But I would say we're, we're lining up nicely with uh, the direction that the national program is going in. So <clears throat> we have set ourselves the goal of becoming a fully digital depository here at UNCG by the end of 2028. And Part of that means uh, going through our DSIMs, which we've done, and we actually dropped over 2,147 tangible or format neutral item selections. So that means we're no longer going to receive, uh, should no longer receive physical materials uh, in the mail. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't have access to this content. It It is still being selected underneath um, an electronic format, uh, this just stops the shipments that we're receiving. Another thing that we've done to get ahead of this is we've offered um, through the system uh, the ACRO provides, um, uh, which lets us offer things that we have to other depositories that might be interested in taking them. Uh, this is all, all, all these documents are government property, and so we have to um, retain them and uh, deselect them in a uh, specific way. Uh, so it takes 45 days, um, and there's a number of different depositories that can actually select these and have them shipped to them. Uh, so in that process, we've actually uh, offered, shipped what was claimed, and then donated over 70,000 of our tangible government documents uh, just this year. So that's uh, a lot of change. Um, we still have a number of documents. Uh, those are newer, and so they have uh, retention schedules that we still have to follow. Um, that's where 2028 comes in, because that's roughly when the newest documents age out at five years. And <clears throat> Some of the reasons for this, other than just being in line with uh, the FDLP and the direction it's going generally, um, that's specific to us, I figure it to be uh, roughly three main considerations that it comes down to, uh, space, time, and effort. So the first thing is saving space, and this one's real simple. Uh, we have a library renovation that's going to be occurring and there's materials that are uh, that we want to keep over and above uh, some of these physical documents that we already have access to online. Um, the next thing is saving time. So the government uh, collection, the federal government collection that we have that's physical is currently in storage. And if you wanted to access it as a, pa as a patron, what you would have to do is submit a document request. You would have to wait for uh, someone to go over there and retrieve it. Um, conversely, the digital items uh, that that we get through the FDLP are immediately accessible online, and <clears throat> they can be concurrently accessed by multiple patrons. So I I feel like those are two really big benefits uh, there. Um, also, and this is kind of related to saving time, but it's saving effort. So we don't have to receive these documents, open the boxes, process them, barcode them, um, and store them. Uh, with digital items, we receive uh, the records for the catalog through what's called the Catalog Record Distribution Program. And it comes with a full mark record for our catalog. It also comes with um, a permalink uh, or a permanent URL, and that's where the government has persistent hosting of that document so that we can link directly from our discovery system to that document. And we're provided this free um, as a member library of the FDLP. So, what I want to do now is transition to our new FDLP guide. 
um, with everything uh, headed digitally, um, having a nice entry point online uh, through one of our LibGuides uh, feels essential. So uh, I'm going to post a link here, I'm try to copy it into the chat. All right, so that's go UNCG edu and then forward slash fdlp and that should take you directly to this link and i'm gonna zoom in here is everyone able to see that clearly okay good <clears throat> so this is going to be the main discovery page and um I want to point out a couple things because we're going to pull out some government documents together uh, to help the spirit of documents pass uh, retrieve the content for his informational poster. Um, so on the left, we have what's called the basic collection. And the basic collection is uh, actually something that the FDLP has created for us to share. Um, it's a list of some of the core sources of information uh, from the US government. So we have assistance li listings, as well as Ben's Guide, which is for children, um, as well as more usual things like congress.gov, the congressional record, um, the uh, analysis and annotated constitution, as well as many other links here. So that should cover most of the most popular uh, government information that people want access to. Um, the other part to this guide is underneath this welcome section, uh, we've got a bulleted list of different ways of accessing and finding US government documents. Uh, so the first thing is, like I mentioned, the basic collection on the left. Uh, the next thing is to simply search our catalog. If you know the name of the document you're after, you might find a hit by searching that way. Um, there's other ways for discovery here though. Uh, so there's the US Catalog of Government Publications linked to here. This is what it looks like. It's not a pretty site, but this will let you um, search for government publications. And I mainly use it to find SUDOC numbers so that I can then search by SUDOC. Another spot that you can check is uh, the govinfo.gov site, which is um, a searchable site. So if we did um, for services and search, it should automatically bring us to govinfo with that search. And they've done a lot of work on this um, for the last five years or so. And uh, so there's lots of really good filters on the left. Uh, you get access to PDFs and details, XML. Um, it's, a, it's a really good resource that's uh, just getting better with time. The other thing is that uh, we created in-house a SUDOC call number search. So if you did something like that A13 SUDOC that we were searching for, what this will do is automatically search within um, our catalog with that SUDOC number already tagged appropriately to search um, by government number. So this can be helpful if you don't know the name, but you know the SUDOC. <clears throat> and then the other part beyond just Google searching uh, gov sites is going to be to use this finding aid here, which I would like people to use uh, momentarily. Uh, it's a series of drop downs where you can find, based on government agency and sub agency, different publication series. So the committee, House Committee on Ethics uh, in Congress, they have prints and rules. Those are mainly what they have. And if we browse, there it is, Rules for Congress House Committee on Ethics. You can access online. And then it's, again, not a very pretty site, but 
these are the rules. And that you could quickly get access that way. All right, so I want to take uh, just a minute to let people uh, navigate to this uh, libguide and uh, use one of these finding aids. Uh, it could be basic collection uh, or this uh, drop down aid. And <clears throat> we're just going to get some government uh, publication titles, uh, something that looks interesting. And then if you wouldn't mind, you just post the title in the chat. Let's we'll see what government documents we find. I'm going to do this along with you too. I always gravitate to the agriculture department for some reason. Bantail pig and pop, pigeon population, <laughs> U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Wow. There's so many things. Hispanic Heritage Month poster for Peace Corps. Okay. And you can probably see on my screen, and maybe you've run into this, um, where you do a search and you get this box but no results. Sometimes that happens if it's not in our catalog but all these government publications are uh, in the public domain and freely accessible. So sometimes if it doesn't show up under our library, you can expand results and still get free access. It's just a peculiarity with the, the way the holdings are set up. Rock slides in Tennessee. That's important. All right, so I think we've got some content to fill the poster for the for the spirit to get out. So let's go back to our presentation. All right, so our story ends. After searching online for the missing poster content, you return to the spirit of documents past and an incantation is recited. I'm free. <laughs> Back to full strength, the spirit of documents past uses documentary powers to unlatch the storage door. As you part ways, you vow to never return to Ferguson's door. <laughs> I had too much fun with that. The end. Epilogue. Here's some of the resources that I used, especially with the history and definitions of the GPO and FDLP program. Uh, here is a thank you for all of you joining us on Halloween today, as well as a link uh, to these slides and my email if you would like to follow up and ask uh, questions about anything uh, that we saw today, um, as well as my email is my email. And I want to uh, go ahead and take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you so much, Joshua. I just wanted to take a moment and say thanks. Um, and then, as you said, open it up for questions. Um, Christine in the chat says the LibGuide is really helpful. Lots of searching options. Yes, I haven't looked at it in a while, I'll be honest. Um, but that was uh, actually very fun to go through and the, uh, use those little finding aids. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Christine. And thanks, Anna. Has anyone ran into a government document they've been looking for and, and struggled to find through the library or had to find through other means?
I see some typing, so Let's see what Hannah is saying. Yes, the scary pumpkin is fun. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny from Anna, who has been accidentally sent things uh, that are government North Carolina state level government documents because people thought they were NC docs and not oh, NC yeah. docs. Can't tell the difference in speaking. I took a gov docs class in library school uh, low, low these long years ago. Um, and, uh, but it was, a, it's nice to get a refresher because I knew that I knew these things pretty well, obviously at that point, but without that day-to-day -day use, um, it's easy to forget things about how the SUDOC system works and things like that. So, yeah, I don't think I realized, um, coming in the government documents that there had been such a long progress towards uh, more and more use of electronic resources uh, being three decades. Uh, that's that's quite a long time, but things continue to change and now they're they're definitely going that direction. There's things that are being created are all being created digitally first now. Um, and 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 that's that's interesting to me because it can create um, jurisdictional uh, considerations. So like if a text version versus a electronic version disagree on some point, normally the, the book has taken precedent, the print version has taken precedent, um, but now that's actually changing. Uh, the book would be wrong and the, the electronic resource would actually be the source of truth. All right, we've got several questions, so I'm going to read them for the recording purposes. Um, so going forward, all public information will have to be accessed digitally. So <clears throat> for the most part, that is true. I would say uh, that we still have uh, those documents that we have retained, uh, that we haven't gotten rid of uh, or deselected. And those are still uh, things that you can request uh, physically. Um, also, uh, these documents are going to be somewhere in print and you can have uh, access to them by going, for instance, to Chapel Hill um, to see their physical copy. Um, but given the, the ease of use with having it digital, and um, especially the concurrent use. Uh, so if a bunch of people were needing to access it at once, um, I see a definite, definite advantage to the digital approach. All right. Um, and then we just had a, a mention that someone took a basic webinar on GovDocs from the Library of Congress, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this, that our own Christine was a government documents and reference librarian in Georgia for nine years exciting to see the changes wow. yeah things have um i mean things have changed a lot just since i've been in i've been a librarian since 2007 and uh it's huge changes i was really surprised actually when i learned last year that we actually could go to to be an entirely digital. um digital depository which is great great for us um with the, some of the things that Joshua mentioned, so. Yes, the FDLP is um, providing helpful um, steps and tips on how to become a fully digital depository. Um, it's, it's definitely in line with um, the direction that they're wanting the National Collection to go. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so uh, we will just give a virtual round of applause to Joshua. Thank you so much um, for sharing this knowledge with us today. Uh, Y'all should be getting a uh, follow-up email from Sam Harlow 
um, when she is back in the office. Um, and if you have any questions about this series, please feel free to contact me or Sam. Um, and I will just leave you with uh, hopes that you all have a wonderful Halloween. Yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you.